on Spiritual Friendship, Part 5. Gratian, are we not to think that you have taken into your friendship all those whom you thus love, and by whom you are so loved? Alred, we embrace very many with every affection, but in such a way that we do not admit them to the secrets of friendship, which consists especially in the revelation of all our confidences and, fr and plans. Whether it is that the Lord in the gospel says, I will not now call you servants, but friends. And then adding the reason for which they are considered worthy of the name of friend, because all things whatsoever I have heard of my father, I have made known to you. And in another place, you are my friends, if you do the things that I command you. From these words, as St. Ambrose says, he gives the formula of friendship for us to follow, namely, that we do the will of our friend, that we disclose to our friend whatever confidences we have in our hearts, and that we be not ignorant of his confidences. Let us lay bare to him our heart, and let him disclose his to us. For a friend hides nothing. If he is true, he pours forth his soul, just as the Lord poured forth the mysteries of the Father. Thus speaks Ambrose. How many, therefore, do we love before it would be imprudent to lay bare our soul and pour out our inner hearts, men whose age or feeling or discretion is not sufficient to bear such revelations. Walter, this friendship is so sublime and perfect that I dare not aspire to it. For me and our friend Gratian, that type of friendship suffices which your Augustine describes, namely, to converse and jest together with good will to humor one another, to read together, to discuss matters together, together to trifle, and together to be in earnest, to differ at times without ill humor, as a man would do with himself, and even by a very infrequent disagreement, which gives zest to our very numerous agreements, to teach one another something or to learn from one another with impatience to long for one another when absent, and with joy to receive one another when returning. By these and similar indications emanating from the hearts of those who love and are loved in turn, through the countenance, the tongue, the eyes, and a thousand pleasures, and a thousand pleasing movements diffuse our spirits by tinder, as it were, and out of many to make but one. This is what we think when we should love in our friends, so that our conscience will be its own accuser. If we have not loved him who in turn loves us, or if we have not returned love to him who first loved us, Alred, this type of friendship belongs to the carnal, and especially to the young people, such as they once were, Augustine and the friend of whom he was then speaking. And yet this friendship accepts for trifles and deceptions. If nothing dishonorable enters into it, it is to be tolerated, and the hope of more abundant grace, as the beginning, so to say, of a holier friendship. By these beginnings, with a growth in piety and constant zeal for things of the Spirit, with the growing seriousness of mature years and the illumination of the spiritual senses, they may, with pure affection, mount to loftier heights from, as it were, a region close by, just as yesterday we said that the friendship of man could be easier translated into a friendship for God 
himself because of the similarity existing between both. But now it is time that we examine the points, one after another, as to how friendship is to be cultivated. Loyalty, then, is the foundation of stability and constancy in friendship. For nothing is stable that is unfaithful. Indeed, the frank, the congenial, and the sympathetic, and those who can be stirred by like qualities, ought to be friends to one another. And all of these qualities pertain to fidelity. For a changeable and crafty character cannot be faithful, nor can those who have not like interests and mutual agreements on like manners be stable or faithful in friendship. Above all things, however, suspicion ought to be avoided, for it is the poison of friendship. Let us never think evil regarding a friend, or believe or agree with anyone speaking evil of our friend. And here, let us add affability in speech, cheerfulness of countenance, suavity in manners, serenity in the expression of the eyes, manners in which there is to be found no slight relish to friendship. For sadness and a rather severe demeanor give one a certain appearance of gravity, but friendship ought to be, so to say, rather relaxed at times. It ought to be somewhat free and mild, and rather inclined to congeniality and easiness of approach without levity or dissipation. It is also a law of friendship that a superior must be on a plane of equality with the inferior. For, often, indeed, persons of inferior rank or order of dignity or knowledge are assumed into friendship by persons of greater excellence. In this case, it behooves them to despise and esteem as nothing, as vanity, what is but an addition to nature, and always to direct their attention to the beauty of friendship, which is not adorned with silken garments or gems, it is not expanded by possessions, does not grow fat with delicacies, does not abound in richness, is not exalted by honors, is not puffed up by dignities. Coming back to the principle of friendship's origin, let them consider with care the quality which nature has given, rather than the external trappings which avarice affords to humankind. Therefore, in friendship, which is the perfect gift of nature and grace alike, let the lofty descend, the lowly ascend, the rich be in want, the poor become rich, and thus let each communicate his condition to the other, so that equality may be the result. Hence it is written, He that had much had nothing over, and that he had little had no want. Never, therefore, prefer yourself to your friend. But if you chance to find yourself the superior in those things which we have mentioned, then do not hesitate to abase yourself before your friend, to give him your confidence, to praise him as if, if he is shy, and to confer honor upon him in inverse proportion to that warranted by his lowliness and poverty. Jonathan, that excellent youth, paying no heed to a royal crown or to the hope of regal power, entered upon a covenant with David. He made the servant, David, an equal in friendship in the Lord. He preferred him to himself. When David was driven into flight before Saul, when he was hiding in the desert, when he was condemned to death, when he was destined for slaughter. Thus Jonathan humiliated himself and exalted his friend. You, he said, shall be king, and I will be the next after you. O mirror most excellent of true friendship, 
marvel of marvels. The king was enraged against his servant and was arousing the entire country against him as one emulous of his power. Accusing the priests of treachery, he was slayed them for mere suspicion. He rages through the woods, searching the valleys, and encompasses mountains and cliffs, which an armed band, while all pledge themselves vindicators of the royal wrath, Jonathan only, who alone could be somewhat justifiably envious, thought it proper to oppose his father, to defer to his friend, and to offer him counsel in the face of his opposition. Preferring friendship to a kingdom, you, he said, shall be king, and I will be next after you. And see how Saul, the father of the youth, strove to arouse envy in him against his friend, heaping him with reproaches, terrifying him with threats, reminding Jonathan that he would be despoiled of a kingdom and deprived of honor. But when Saul had uttered the sentence of death against David, Jonathan did not fail his friend. Why shall David die? Wherein has he sinned? What has he done? He puts his life in his hands and slew the Philistine, and you rejoiced. Why, therefore, shall he die? At this utterance the king became angered and strove to nail Jonathan to the wall with his spear. And, adding reproaches to threats, he said, You son of a woman that is the ravisher of a man, I know that you love him to your own confusion and to the confusion your shameless mother. Then he spewed out poison to steep the heart of the youth, adding the word that was an inducement to ambition, a ferment of envy, an incentive to emoliousness and bitterness. As long as the son of Jesse lives, your kingdom will not be established. Who would not be stirred by these words, and who would not be made envious? Whose love, whose favors, whose friendship would these words not corrupt, nor diminish, nor obliterate? That most loving youth, preserving the laws of friendship, brave in the face of threats, patient before reproaches, despising a kingdom because of his friendship, unmindful of glory, but mindful of grace, declared, You shall be king, and I will be next after you. Tullius says that some have found who think it mean to prefer money to friendship, but that it is impossible to discover those who do not put honors, civic offices, military commands, power, or riches before friendship. So that, when these sentiments are offered on the one hand, and the claims of friendship on the other, they will much prefer the former, for nature is too weak to despise power. For where, he says, will you find one who prefers the honor of his friend to his own? Behold, Jonathan was found a victor over nature, a despiser of glory and of power, one who preferred the honor of his friend to his own, saying, You shall be king, and I shall be next after you. This is true, perfect, constant, and eternal friendship, which envy does not corrupt, nor suspicion diminish, nor ambition dissolve, which, thus tempted, does not yield, thus assailed, does not fall, which is perceived to be unyielding through, struck by reproaches innumerable, and though wounded by injuries manifold. Therefore, go and do you in like manner. 
But if you think it hard and even impossible to prefer him whom you love to yourself, do not fail at least to behold him on an equal footing with yourself if you wish to be a friend. For they do not rightly develop friendships who do not preserve equality. Defer to your friend as to an equal, says Ambrose, and be not ashamed to participate a friend for in service, for friendship knows no pride. Indeed, the faithful friend is the medicine of life, the charm of immorality. Now let us devote our attention to the question of how the benefits of friendship are to be cultivated, and on this topic let us wrest some information from another's hand. Let this law, someone says, be established with respect to friendship, that we seek what is honorable from our friends and ourselves perform what is honorable for them and let us not wait to be asked. Let there never be a delay in a friend's service. If we must prepare to lose money on our friends, how much more ought we be prepared to give it to them when their advantage or their need requires it? But not all can do everything. One abounds in money another in lands and goods. One can effect more by counsel, and still another excels in dignity of office. But in these matters, consider prudently how you must conduct yourself towards your friend. And concerning money, Scripture has given ample advice. Lose your money for your friend. But as the eyes of the wise men are in his head, let us, if we are members and Christ the head, act according to the words of the prophet. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, so that we may receive our manner of life from the Lord, concerning which it is written, If any want wisdom, let him ask to God, who gives to all men abundantly and does not upbraid. Therefore, give to your friend in such a way that you do not approach him or expect a reward. Do not wrinkle your brow or turn aside your countenance or avert your eyes, but with a serene countenance, a cheerful aspect and pleasing speech, anticipate the request of him who is seeking a favor. Meet him with kindness so that you may appear to be granting his request without being asked. The sensitive soul thinks nothing more worthy of a blush than to beg. Since, therefore, you and your friend ought to be of one heart and one soul, it is unjust, if there is not also but one purse. Let this law, therefore, be held in respect among friends namely, that they expend themselves and their goods for one another in such a way that he who gives preserves a cheerful aspect, and that he who receives does not lose confidence. When Booz observed the poverty of Ruth, the, Ma the Maobite, the Moabite, he spoke to her as she was gathering ears of corn behind his reapers, consoling her and invited her to the table of his servants, and sparing in kindly fashion her embarrassment, he ordered his reapers to leave ears of corn, even purposely so that she might collect them without shame. In the same way, we ought the more adroitly seek out the needs of our friends, anticipate their requests by good services, and observe such demeanor in our giving that the re re recipient, rather than the giver, appears to be bestowing the favor. Walter. But for us, 
who are permitted to receive nothing and to bestow nothing, what will be the charm of a spiritual friendship in this respect? Allred Men would lead a very happy life, says the wise man, if these two words were taken from their midst, namely, mine and yours. For holy poverty certainly bestows great strength upon spiritual friendship, poverty which is holy, for the reason that it is voluntary. For since cupidity makes heavy demands on friendship, friendship once attained is more easily preserved in proportion as the soul is found more purified of his pest. There are, moreover, other resources of spiritual love, by means of which friends can be of aid and advantage to one another. The first is to be solicitous for one another, to pray for one another, to blush for one another, to rejoice for one another, to grieve for one another's fall as to one's own, to regard another's progress as one's own. By whatever means are in one's power, one ought to raise the weak, support the infirm, console the afflicted, restrain the wrathful. Furthermore, one ought to respect the eye of a friend as to dare to do nothing which is dishonorable, or dare to say nothing which is unbecoming. For when one fails oneself in anything, the act ought to well over to one's friends that the sinner not only blushes and grieves within himself, but that even the friend who sees or hears reproaches him as if he himself has sinned. In fact, the friend will believe that he deserves no compassion, but that his erring associate does. Therefore, the best companion of friendship is reverence, and so he who deprives friendship of respect takes away its greatest adornment. How often has the nod of my friend restrained or extinguished the flame of anger aroused within me and already bursting forth into public gaze? How frequent his rather severe demeanor has repressed the unbecoming word already on my lips. How often, when carelessly breaking into laughter or lapsing into idleness, I have recovered a proper dignity at his approach. Besides, whatever counsel is to be given is more easily deceived from a friend and more steadfastly retained, for a friend's power in counseling must needs be great, since there can neither be doubt of his loyalty nor suspicion of flattery. Therefore, let friend counsel friend as to what is right, securely open and freely. And friends are not only to be admonished, but if necessity arise, reproved as well. For although truth is offensive to some, seeing that hatred is born of it according to the aphorism, compliance begets friends, truth gives birth to hatred. Yet that complacency is far more hurtful, because it indulges in wrongdoing and thus suffers a friend to be born, a long headlong to ruin. However, the friend is more grievously culpable, and therefore especially to be reproached if he scorns truth, and by complacences and blandishments is driven to crime. Not that we ought not kindly to wander our friends, and often praise them. But in all things moderation must be preserved, so that admonition be without bitterness, and reproof be without incentive. Indeed, in humoring and praising let there be a certain kind and honorable friendliness, but let subservancy, the helpmate of vices, be far removed as a thing unworthy not only of a friend, but even 
of any freeborn person. Moreover, if a man's ears are so clothed to the truth that he is not able to hear the truth from a friend, his salvation must be despaired of. Therefore, as St. Ambrose says, if you perceive any vice in your friend, correct him secretly, but he will not listen to you, correct him openly. For corrections are good and often better than a friendship which holds its peace. And even though your friend think himself wronged, nevertheless correct him. Even though the bitterness of correction wounds his soul, nevertheless cease not to correct him. For the wounds inflicted by a friend are more tolerable than the kisses of flatterers. Therefore, the correct the erring friend. And yet, above all things, one ought to avoid anger and bitterness of spirit in correction, that he may be seen to have the betterment of his friend at heart rather than the satisfaction of his own ill humor. For I have seen some, in correcting their friends, clothe with the name now of zeal, now of liberty, the bitterness within them and their outsurging rage, and because they follow impulse rather than reason, they never affect any good by such correction, but rather cause harm. But among friends there is no excuse for this vice, for a friend ought to sympathize with a friend. He ought to be condensed to think of his friend's fault as his own, to correct him humbly and sympathetically. Let a somewhat troubled countenance make the reproof, and also saddened utterance. Let tears interrupt words, so that the other may not only see, but even feel that the reproof proceeds from love rather than from rancor. If he chance to have rejected the first correction, let him receive even a second. Meanwhile, prayer and weep, displaying a troubled countenance, but preserving a holy affection. One ought even to study the disposition of his heart, for there are those whom coaxing are effective, and such persons quite readily assent thereto. There are others who are by impervious to coaxing, and are more easily corrected by a word or a blow. Let a man, therefore, conform and adapt himself to his friend, to be in harmony with his disposition, as one ought to be of aid to a friend in his material setbacks, so he ought to more readily hasten to succor him in the trials of the spirit. It is characteristic of friendship to admonish and to be admonished, and to do the former freely, not harshly, and to receive the latter patiently, not resentfully. So it should be understood that in friendship there is no greater pest than flattery and subserviency, which are the marks of fickle and deceitful men who speak everything at the whim of another, but speak nothing with an eye to truth. Accordingly, let there be no hesitation among friends and no pretense a thing most of all repugnant to friendship. Indeed, a man owes truth to his friend, without which the name of friendship has no value. Indeed, a man owes truth to his friend, without which the name of friendship has no value. The just man, says holy David, shall correct me in mercy and shall reprove me but let it not the oil of the sinner flat fatten my head. The pretender and the man of cunning provoke the wrath of God. Thus the Lord says through his prophet, O oh, my people, they that call you blessed, for the same deceive you and destroy the way of your steps. For, as Solomon says, the dissembler with his mouth deceives his friend. Therefore, friendship ought so to be cultivated that, 
although it may tolerate simulization, for good reasons, it will never tolerate simulation. Walter, how, pray, can dissimulation be necessary, a thing which, so it seems to me, always a vice? Alred, you are mistaken, son, for God is said to dissimulate in regards to the sins of the delinquent, not wishing the death of the sinner, but that he be converted and live. Walter, distinguish, please, between simulation and dissimulation. Alred, Alred, simulation, I think, is a kind of deceptive agreement opposed to the judgment of reason, which Terence in the person of Natho rather excellently expressed. Does someone say no? I say no. Does one say yes? I say yes, too. In fine, I have ordered myself to give assent in everything. Perhaps that well-known pagan borrowed these ideas from our treasures, expressing the sentiment of our prophet in his own words. For it is clear that the prophet said this very thing in the person of the perverted people. See errors for us. Speak unto us pleasant things. And in another place, the prophets prophesied falsehood, and the priests clapped their hands, and my people loved such things. This vice would be detested everywhere, always and everywhere it should be shunned. Now, dissimulation is in a sense a dispensing with, or putting off of punishment or correction, without interior approval, in consideration of place, time, or person. For if a friend, when he is in midst of others, should commit some fault, he should not suddenly and publicly be reproached, but ought to dissemble because of the place, nay, further, as far as is compatible with truth, one ought to excuse what one has done, and wait to administer in secret the deserved rebuke. Likewise, at, at a time when the mind is engrossed with many considerations, so is less receptive to these matters which must be spoken, or when others have intervened, the friend's feelings are a trifle more moved than he is, in consequence, somewhat disturbed. In both instances, there is need of simulation until the tumult within has been calmed without irritation, the needful correction. When King David, yielding to lust, added murder to adultery, the prophet Nathan was sent to correct him. Deferential to his royal majesty, he did not suddenly nor with agitation of mind accused so distinguished a personage of his crime, but using the shield of suitable dissimulation, he prudently extracted from the king himself a judgment against his own person. Walter, that distinction pleases me very much, but I would like to know whether a friend who has more power and is able to promote whomsoever he wishes to honors and distinguished ought to prefer to others in such promotions whom those he cherishes and by whom he is cherished, and, if so, whether he ought among his friends give precedence to those whom he loves with greater predilection. Alred, in regard to this spirit, it is to our advantage to examine how friendship is to be cultivated. For there are some persons who think they are not loved because they cannot be promoted, or allege that they are despised if they are not entrusted with responsibilities and offices. 
We know that as a result of this type of thinking, no small discord has sprung up among those who were considered friends, so that estrangement follows upon indignation and railings upon estrangement. Thus great caution must be observed in conferring of dignities and offices, especially ecclesiastical ones. You should not be concerned about what you are able to bestow, but rather about what he, upon whom you best bestow anything, can endure. Indeed, many are to be loved, who nevertheless should not be advanced to office, and we, happily and laudably, embrace many whom we could not involve in responsibilities and undertakings without grave sin on our part and great danger on theirs. Therefore, in these matters, one should always be guided by reason and not by affection. A dignity and burden of office should not be imposed on those whom we prefer as friends, but rather on those whom we believe better suited to sustain such dignities and burdens. Where, however, equality of virtue is found, I do not greatly disapprove, if to some degree affection gives play to its feelings. Nor should anyone say that he is held in contempt for the reasons that he is not promoted, since the Lord Jesus preferred Peter to John in this respect, nor did he, on that account, lessen his affection for John, because he had given Peter the leadership. To Peter he recommended his church, to John his most beloved mother. To Peter he gave the keys of the kingdom, to John he revealed the secrets of his heart. Peter, therefore, was the more exalted, John the more secure. Although Peter was established in power, nevertheless, when Jesus said, One of you will betray me, he was afraid and trembled along with the rest. But John, leaning on the bosom of his master, was made the bolder, and at a nod from Peter asked who the traitor was. Peter, therefore, was exposed to action. John was reserved for love, according to the words of Christ. So will I have him remain till I come. Thus Jesus gave us the example that we might do in like manner. Let us afford our friends whatever love, whatever kindness, whatever sweetness, whatever charity we can, but let us impose vain honors and burdens on those who, reason dictates, should be burdened, realizing that a man never truly loves a friend that he is not satisfied with his friend as he is, but must needs add these words in contemptible honors. One must also greatly guard against permitting a too tender affection from hindering a greater utility. This would be the case we were unwilling to part from or to burden those whom we embrace in greater charity, then great hope of more abundant fruit is to be realized, for this is well-ordered friendship, namely, that reason rules affection and that we attend to the general welfare than our friend's good humor, that reason rules affection, and that we attend more to the general welfare than to our friend's good humor. I recall now two friends who, although they have passed from this present life, nevertheless live to me and always will so live. The first of these I gained as my friend when I was still young, in the beginning of my conversion, because of a certain resemblance between us in character and similarity of interests, the other I chose when he was still a boy, and after I had tested him repeatedly, 
in various ways. When, at length, age was silvering my hair, I admitted him into the most intimate friendship. Indeed, I chose the former as my companion, as one who shared in the delights of the cloister, and the spiritual joys which I was just beginning to taste when I, too, was not as yet burdened with any pastoral duty or perplexed with temporal affairs. I demanded nothing and I bestowed nothing but affection on the loving judgment of affection itself according as charity dictated. The latter I claimed when he was still young to be a sharer in my anxieties and a co-worker in these labors of mine. Looking back as far as my memory permits, upon these friendships I see that the first rested upon the most part on affection and the second on reason, although affection was not lacking in the latter, or reason in the former. In fine, my first friend, taken from me at the very beginning of our friendship, I was able to choose, as I have said, but not to test, the other devoted to me from boyhood even to middle age, and loved by me mounted with me through all the stages of friendship, as far as human imperfection permitted. And indeed, it was my admiration for his virtue that first directed my affection towards him, and it was I who long ago brought him from the south to this northern solicitude then first introduced him into regular discipline. From that time he learned to conquer his own flesh and to endure labor and hunger. The very many he was an example, to many a source of admiration, and to myself a source of honor and delight. Already at that time I thought that he should be nurtured in the beginnings of friendship, seeing that he was a burden to no one but pleasing to all. He came and went, hastening the command of his superiors, humble, gentle, reserved in matter, sparing of speech, a stranger to indignation, and unacquainted with murmuring rancor and detraction. He walked as one deaf, hearing not, and as one dumb, not opening his mouth. He became as a beast of burden, submissive to the reins of obedience and bearing entirely the yoke of regular b discipline in mind and body. The boy was so ashamed at this that he immediately left the infirmary and subjected himself with such once, when he was still young, he was in the infirmary, and was rebuked by my holy father and predecessor for yielding so early in life to rest and inactivity. The boy was so ashamed at this that he immediately left the infirmary and subjected himself with such zeal to corporal labor that for many years he would not allow himself any relaxation from his accustomed rigor. Even when he was afflicted with serious illness— all this, in a most wondrous way, had bound him to me by the most intimate bonds, and had so brought him into my affection, that from an inferior I made him my companion, from the companion a friend, from a friend my most cherished of friends. For when I saw that he had advanced far in the life of virtue and grace, I consulted the brethren and imposed upon him the burden of sub-priorship. This burden, against his will to be sure, but because he had vowed himself to obedience, he modestly accepted, yet he pleaded with me in secret to be relieved of it, alleging that as an excuse his age, his lack of knowledge, and finally the friendship which he had but lately formed, fearful that this might prove to be an occasion for him either to love the less or to be loved the less. But availing nothing by these 
entreaties that he began to reveal quite freely, but at the same time humbly and modesty, what he feared for each of us, and what in me pleased him but little. He hoped thereby, as he afterwards confessed, that I would be offended by his presumption, and would the more easily be inclined to grant his request. But his freedom of speech and spirit only led our friendship to its culmination, for my desire for his friendship was lessened not a whit. Perceiving then that his words had pleased me, and that I answered humbly to each accusation and had satisfied him in all these matters, and that he himself had not only caused no offense, but rather had received more fruitful benefit, He began to manifest his love for me even more ardently than theretofore to relax the reins of his affection and to reveal himself wholly to my heart. In this way we tested one another, I making proof of his freedom of utterance and he of my patience, and I too repaid my friend in kind in his turn thinking that I should, at an opportune moment, harshly reprove him, I did not spare him any, as it were, reproaches, and found him patient with my frankness and grateful. And then I began to reveal to him the secrets of my innermost thoughts, and I found him faithful. In this way, love increased between us, affection glowed, the warmer and charity was strengthened, until we attained that stage at which we had but one mind and one soul, to will and not to will alike, and at which our love was devoid of fear or ignorant of offense, shunning suspicion and abhorring flattery. There was no pretense between us, no simulation, no dishonorable flattery, no unbecoming harshness, no evasion, no concealment, but everything open and above board, for I deemed my heart in a fashion his and his mine, and he felt in like manner towards me. And so, as we were progressing in friendship without deviation, neither correction evoked the indignation of the other, neither's yielding produced blame. Therefore, proving himself a friend in every respect, he provided as much as he was in his power for my peace and my rest. He exposed himself to dangers and forestalled scandals in their very inception. Occasionally I wanted to provide him for his ailments which some alleviation from creature comforts, but he opposed it, and saying that we should be on our guard against having our love measured according to the consolation of the flesh and having the gift be ascribed to my carnal affection rather than to his need with the result in effect that my authority might be in consequence, be diminished. He was, therefore, as it were, my hand, my eye, the staff of my old age. He was the refuge of my spirit, the sweet solstice of my griefs, whose heart of love received me when fatigued from labors, whose counsel refreshed me when plunged into sadness and grief. He himself calmed me when distressed, soothed me when angry. Whenever anything unpleasant occurred, I referred it to him, so that, shoulder to shoulder, I was able to bear more easily what I could not bear alone. What more is there, then, that I can say? It was not a foretaste of blessedness, thus to love and thus to be loved. Thus to help and thus to be helped, and in this way from sweetness of fraternal charity 
to wing one's flight aloft that more sublime splendor of divine love and the ladder of charity now to mount to the embrace of Christ himself and again to descend to the love of neighbor which there, there pleasantly to rest and so in this friendship of ours which we have introduced by way of example if you see aught worthy of imitation profit by it to advance your own perfection but since it is growing late and we must at last close this discussion of ours you are surely convinced that friendship is founded on love indeed who is there that can love one another if one does not love himself since from a comparison that love by which he is dear to himself a man ought to regulate his love for his neighbor a man does not love himself who exacts him of himself or commands from himself anything shameful or dishonorable in the first place then one must needs chastise oneself allowing nothing which is unbecoming and refusing nothing which is profitable and loving himself thus, let him follow the same rule in loving his neighbor. But as his love includes many persons, let him choose from among them whom he can admit in familiar fashion to the mysteries of friendship, and upon whom he can bestow his affection in abundance, laying bare his mind and even to their sinews and marrow, that is, even to the most secret thoughts and desires of the heart. Let such a friend be chosen, moreover, not according to the caprice of affection, but rather according to the foresight of reason. Because of similarity of character and the contemplation of virtue, then let a man so attach himself to his friend that all levity be absent and all joy be present, and there be no lack of proper service and courtesies of beneficence and charity. Next, let the loyalty of your proposed friend be tested, as well as his honor and his patience. Let there gradually be added sharing of counsels, application of common concern, and certainly conformity in outward expression for friends ought to be so alike that immediately upon seeing one another a likeness of expression is reflected from the first to the second whether he can cast down by sorrow or serene with joy after he has thus chosen and tested when you are assured that he will wish to ask of a friend or to do himself ask nothing that would be unbecoming and moreover when you are confident that he looks upon friendship as a virtue and not as a trade and that he shuns flattery and detests obsequiousness and finally when you have discovered that he is frank yet with discretion patient under reproof firm and constant in affection then you will experience that spiritual delight, namely, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How advantageous it is then to grieve for one's another, to toil for one another, to bear one's another's burdens, while each considers it sweet to forget himself for the sake of another, to prefer the will of another to his own, to minister to the other's needs rather than one's own, to oppose and expose oneself to misfortunes. Meanwhile, how delightful friends find it to converse with one another, mutually to reveal their interests, to examine all things together, and to agree on all of them. Added to this, there is prayer for one another, which, com coming from a friend, 
is more effect, efficacious in proportion as it is more lovingly sent to God with tears which either fear excites or affection awakes or sorrow evokes, and thus a friend's praying to Christ on behalf of his friend and for his friend's sake desiring to be heard by Christ directs his attention with love and longing to Christ, then it is sometimes happens that quickly and imperceptibly the one who love passes over into the other in coming, as it were, with the sweetness of thus ascending from that holy love which he embraces a friend to that which he embraces Christ, he will joyfully partake in abundance of the spiritual fruit of friendship, awaiting the fullness of all things in the life to come. Then, with the dispelling of all anxiety by reason, of which we now fear and are solicitous for one another, with removal of all adversity, which is now behooves us to bear to one another, above all, with the destruction of the sting of death together with death itself, Those pangs now often trouble us and force us to grieve for one another. With salvation secured, we shall rejoice in the eternal possession of supreme goodness. And this friendship, to which we admit but few, will be outpoured upon all and by all, outpoured upon God, and God shall be all in all.